Creating a finite abstract model in multi-place predicate logic is certainly trickier than doing it in single place. You need to pay attention to a lot more things, and you really need to be sure that your abstract translation is correct. Uh, so some of us might choose to go the truth functional expansion route, and that is reasonable, but uh, of course truth functional expansion has limitations. So let's just look to see how we would truth functionally expand a multi-place predicate. And it actually expands in the exact way that you would expect. The rules are the exact same as in single place. So here, I'm going to expand the universal quantifier first. Uh, as you saw from my previous lecture video, I always prefer to go from the outside in, and so that's why I picked the universal. It's just an arbitrary choice, no other reason. So here, my universe of discourse is 0, 1. And what does it mean for all x, there exists a y, m, y, x? Uh, well, it means this is true for 0, and it's true for 1, because that's what the universal says. So I will expand and replace my universal quantifier with a conjunction and replace my x first with 0, the first member of the universe of discourse, and then with 1, the second member. At this point, I'm now ready to expand the existentials. And I can do them at the same time now that I'm sort of more comfortable with uh, truth functional expansion. And so the existential means I'm going to expand what's under the scope, which is the my0, and then the my1, and I'm going to expand to 0 and then to 1, but of course existentials expand to disjunctions. So I get this picture. First I get the m0,0 or m1,0, and that entire thing is the left conjunct of the main universally related conditional, sorry, conjunction. And then on the right conjunct I get m0,1 or m1,1, and that disjunction uh, is related to the second existential statement. So that's expansion. Uh, don't f forget that when you expand things where the scope is sort of uh, not over the entire thing, it, you need to restrict the expansion of, of your uh, quantifier. So here I'm going to go outside again, uh, outside in again, and I have there exists x, fx, and for all y, negation m, x, y. I have again a universe of discourse of two members, 0, 1. So the first expansion of this is an expansion of the entire thing, because the existential ranges over the entire sentence. And so the main connective will become a disjunction, where the first disjunct, all the x's are zeros, and the second disjunct, all the x's become ones. So this is a very mechanical process. At this point, though, I do need to expand my two remaining quantifiers, the universal, but remember, the universal expands in such a way that it only affects what it's modifying. So negation m0y and negation m1y, those are the things that are under the scope of the universal, and only those. So when I replace those universals with a conjunction, and I put in my 0, and then I put and, and then I put in my 1, and so on, it's just, that conjunction is just going to modify what falls under the universals. And so we get something that looks like this. So the truth functional expansion in multiplace predicate logic, the rules are identical as before. So there's nothing really new to learn here. It's just sort of a demonstration that your previous skills uh, stay the same in multiplace, and you just expand methodically one step at a time and never overreach the scope of your expansion. Now what we can do with the truth functional expansion is essentially the same thing, but it's actually a far more powerful tool in multiplace because multiplace models can be sometimes confusing to generate. So what I'm going to do is do a truth functional expansion and model of this argument, and I'm going to create the model using my truth functional expansion to show that this argument is invalid. Of course the first step is generating my expansion, but we've already expanded the first two statements, uh, the, sorry, the first two premises, and the expansion of the conclusion is in single place, so we get something that looks like this. Let's tidy this up and zero in on precisely what we want to do here. What I want to do to show that this argument is invalid is I want to show that uh, both premises are true and the conclusion is false. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at this table, and this table is going to essentially just keep track of my uh, sort of truth properties so that I can actually generate my final model. All right, I want to make the first premise true. 
And so the first premise is a conjunction. So this conjunction, to be true, we know that both conjuncts must be true. Now, if you look at each conjunct, within the left side and the right side are disjunctions. And disjunctions are really nice because I don't need to make everything true. In fact, I just need to make one side of it true. Uh, so what I'm going to focus on is arbitrarily, I'm just going to pick the left disjunct. Why did I pick the left disjunct? No particular reason. I just need a starting point, so I'm just ready to go. Now, if you look at my table on the bottom, the table on my bottom essentially is a way for me to log the status of each possibility for my predicates. Because I only have a universe of two members, uh, either 0 is an H or it's not. Either 1 is an H or it's not. Same thing with F. Now, in the two-place predicate M, because I only have two things in my model, there's really actually only four options. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So now when I look up at premise 1, what I've realized is I want M00 to be true, and I want M01 to be true, because that is enough to create truth in the entire premise. So I do that just by adding a T in my little table so that I keep track of things. If you think this looks familiar, it does. What we're sort of doing is a play on a shortened truth table because I've expanded out my multiplace predicate sentence into something that looks like sentential. Now I'm focused on premise two, and I want premise two to be true. Um, and when I look at premise two, I have these uh, sort of disjuncts, and I also have these conjunctions on the inside. Uh, so where am I going to go? Um, well, I can arbitrarily choose to actually go and take a look at the left disjunct. Why? It doesn't matter. I just pick the left one. And I know that all I need is one disjunction to be true so that the entire premise two will be true. All right. So how do I make this true? This is actually really nice because everything in that disjunction is uh, actually, in, in that left disjunct, is just ands. So I need F0 to be true, I need negation M00 to be true, and negation M01 to be true. And of course the way to do that is to put a false uh, next to M00 and M01 and a true under F0. Because if the negation of M00 is true, that means M00 must be false. And the same for M01. But obviously, there's a problem. I can't have these be true and false together. That's impossible. So instead, I actually think I started off on the wrong spot. And instead, I'm going to move over and consider the right disjunct. So I'm going to erase all the work that I just did, and I'm going to look at the right disjunct to see if I can make that true. Well, again, this one says F1 must be true. Negation M10 must be true. Negation M11 must be true. But if the negations are true, then the original is false. And so I get this in my model instead. T under F1, false under M10, false under M11. And this is enough to make my second premise true. Because all I need is one disjunction. Finally, I look at the conclusion. And the conclusion uh, is H0 arrow F0 and H1 arrow F1. And to make this false, I don't need to make both sides false. It's sufficient to just make one side. So I'm going to arbitrarily pick, and I pick H0 arrow F0. Uh, in fact, this is a good choice uh, because the other way wouldn't have worked. But to make this false, I have to set the antecedent to be true and the conclusion be false. So I get T under H0 and an F under F0. The last step is to actually construct my model. And to construct my model, the table is really all the information that I need. And that table came from uh, my truth functional expansion and just a simple shortened truth table game where I was analyzing the truth of the connectives and there were no more quantifiers anymore. And so what this table tells me is all the things that are true must be in the uh, finite extensional model, uh, finite abstract model, in the extension of whatever predicate it is true. And whatever is false cannot appear. Now what about H1? H1 doesn't have true or false in it at all. Well, that typically means that you can put it in or not. It won't impact your model. But it's always safest just to not put anything in if it indeed doesn't have true next to it. So the final answer after I 
do my truth functional expansion is just this model here. And this model corresponds perfectly to the table that I generated when going through and doing essentially a shortened truth table technique. So if you recall, uh, we asked why truth functional expansion was useful. And of course, uh, we realized that truth functional expansion is particularly useful in multiplace predicate logic because we can generate a finite extensional model in a very nice purely mechanical way. Now, we've also sort of been talking in the periphery about how uh, it gives us a deeper understanding of quantifiers because we now, we now know what a quantifier really means. Universal just means and, and existential just means or. Um, but I'm going to look at one final example uh, which will really help clear something up and gives us a nice understanding of the way quantifiers relate to each other. If you look here, uh, what this is an example of is the difference of the order of when I see quantifiers. So on uh, one side I have the universal uh, followed by the existential and on the right hand side I have the existential followed by the universal. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a truth functional expansion to break these down in a universe of just 0 and 1 and then we will actually see why these do not mean the same thing. So to expand the first one, for all x there exists a y and xy, uh, I will expand the universal first. That's easy. I replace the x with 0 and I replace the x with 1 and I put a conjunction in the middle. Now I'm ready to expand both my uh, existentials and to expand both my uh, existentials uh, I go ahead and mark them and then I expand them in the same way but I must make sure that the main connective is still the conditional because that is the main operator in the original st sentence uh, and I get something that looks like this first I drop the quantifier I replace the y with 0 then with 1 and I put a disjunction in the middle and I do it on both sides Okay, so that's the expansion of the left. Now the expansion of the right is pretty much uh, the same, except I have to do it in a different order because I always go outside in. I start with the existential. And so here the main connective is a disjunction because the existential comes first. Now given what we've just covered, you should look at this and immediately realize what the meaning behind these things are and how the quantifier order changes the meaning. Let's look at the first expansion, so the one on the left. Now, if I want this statement to be true, I need both conjuncts to be true. But fortunately, the left conjunct and the right conjunct are themselves disjunctions. And so because they're disjunctions, I can actually just uh, make one disjunct true. So I could make n0,0 true and n11 true. And that would be enough to make it so that my original sentence is true. Now, if you look at the meaning of my original sentence, it says x ends y, and x is everything, and y is something. So it says everything stands in the n relation to something. But of course, because of the quantifier order, it means something nonspecific, and I've always, always told you it means something nonspecific. But now we see why. In the expansion, it's clear that this can be made true by having uh, everything n a different thing. So 0 ends itself, and then 1 ends itself. And that's actually good enough to make it true. And so that's why the thing, the, sp the, the thing that everything ends is nonspecific. It can change based off of what uh, the universal part is first. But if we look on the right-hand side, where the existential comes first, this disjunction can be made true by either one being true. But if you actually look at them, you'll realize, and here I'm going to focus on the right-hand one, that still the sentence says everything ends something. But that something, in this case, is specific. You either have to pick, does everything end 0 or does everything end 1? And in this case, I've actually picked that everything ends 1, which means that this is specific. So this is a really nice example and hopefully will clarify what quantifier order really is. 
Now remember, I also talked about why this is not useful, truth functional expansion, and it's not useful for all the reasons that uh, uh, before. It's extremely slow, terrible for large universes of discourses, uh, universe must be finite, etc., etc. And so I don't typically recommend doing a truth functional expansion unless you're really asked. Uh, there is one exception, which is if you have a, a statement that you really don't know how to abstractly translate, Doing a truth functional expansion to two members is often very helpful in figuring out what that thing means. We've covered everything we need to know for finite abstract models and truth functional expansions in predicate logic, all the way through multiplace and identity. And with that, we can actually create models to show uh, some important semantic properties. Now, what I've sort of suggested in a previous video is that we can't actually show all these things. And the reason why is for the same reasons that shortened truth tables can't show everything in sentential logic. I cannot show the, se the semantic properties which require me to show something for all interpretations. Uh, and the reason why is because some interpretations will have universes of discourses that are infinite in size. And so, a finite model or truth functional expansion can never have a UD of infinite size. So the last remaining question is how can I show uh, an argument is valid in purely semantic terms? How can I show that it is a statement is a tautology in pure semantic terms? How can I show something for all interpretations when I already know that there are infinitely many interpretations out there? Um, it turns out that there's not a great answer to this, and uh, we'll sort of have to work our way through a potential way to navigate this problem, and that will sort of tie together all the loose ends in our semantic section.